Today on Straight Talk Africa, hundreds of thousands of refugees are fleeing conflict zones in the Middle East and Africa for Europe. We'll discuss what the international community can do to stop the exodus and to find a lasting solution to the crisis. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, September 9th. I am Shaka Sali. And hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariam Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the crisis facing African refugees seeking a better life in Europe and elsewhere. Well, coming up later in our SDA inbox, we'll share your thoughts on this heartbreaking topic through emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, the numbers are staggering for refugees from the Middle East and Africa who are searching for a safer heaven, and the EU Commission is working tirelessly on resolving the crisis. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. They are coming mostly from war-torn Syria but also from Iraq, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Somalia, even Nigeria, where there is chaos, violence, massive unemployment. Refugees will risk everything in hopes of finding peace and the possibility of a better life. The first stop for those that survive the escape is often Europe. Recent weeks have brought shocking images of drowning deaths, crowds of refugees at train stations, and endless chains of desperate families and individuals on the march. The United Nations' Antonio Guterres. We are facing exceptional circumstances. We need an exceptional response. Business as usual or incremental improvements of mechanisms in place will not be able to address what it is today, a massive refugee and migration crisis in Europe. In the Middle East, 1,500,000 Syrians have fled to Turkey alone since the conflict began, with millions more in Lebanon, Jordan, and seeking refuge outside their homes in Syria itself. In contrast, in Israel and Hungary, border fences are rapidly going up and being extended. Those governments say they are sympathetic but unable to accept more refugees. Led by Germany's Angela Merkel, the European Union is trying to work out a plan proportioning out the asylum seekers overwhelming Greece, Italy, Hungary, and the Balkans. EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker says it is proposing an emergency trust fund for Africa to address the root causes of the migration problem. 160,000, that's the number Europeans have to take in charge, and I really hope that this time everyone will be on board. Action is what is needed for the time being. By the end of the year, some 800,000 migrants and refugees will have crossed into Germany. France says it will accept 25,000. England will take 20,000 Syrians by the year 2020. This week, thousands of refugees have passed through Hungary to Austria and beyond, hoping to find safety and opportunity any place that will take them. Among the most frightening situations are those of the desperate being smuggled in trucks from near the African coast and crowded onto vessels attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea. More than 350,000 people have crossed into Europe by sea from North Africa and the Middle East so far this year. And more than 2,600 of them have died in the attempt. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now, joining us here in our Washington studios is our distinguished guest, Demetrius Papa Dimitrio, Senior Fellow and President Emeritus of the Migration Policy Institute, or MPI, a Washington-based think tank dedicated exclusively to the study of international migration. He also serves as President of Migration Policy Institute Europe, where I have to say, frankly, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. 
It is my pleasure. That's what we're supposed to do. You're most welcome, sir. And Itai Vilili, the media and communication officer and spokesperson of the International Organization for Migration, an intergovernmental organization committed to an orderly migration and society. Mr. Vilili joins us via Skype from Geneva in Switzerland. Thank you very much uh, for joining us again for the first time, Itai. Thank you very much, Shaka. You're most welcome, sir. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. U.S. country code is 1. But before we begin our discussion, I am now joined by, the, by Mutasi Ali, Executive Director of the African Refugee Development Center, a non-government organization founded by African asylum seekers and Israel, Israeli citizens, in order to assist Africans who are seeking asylum in Israel. A Darfolian in Sudan, Mr. Ali, has become a symbol of hope for asylum seekers in Israel. He was released last month from the Holot Detention Center after spending 14 months there. He joined us via telephone link up from Tel Aviv. Good evening, Mutasim. Good evening. So what earns you the distinction of becoming uh, a terrific symbol of uh, asylum seekers in Israel? Well, I think it, it started with uh, my political activism in university. Uh, before I was, uh, I was, I mean, I had to leave my country. Um, I've been in jail a few times because of the um, opposition, I mean, opposing the Sudanese regime. Uh, making it to Israel, believing that it might be a safe haven for asylum seekers, and we find ourselves in a limbo situation. Um, I had to advocate for myself and the rest of my friends who are living in Israel, so it came really spontaneous. You know, there is a saying that uh, if you don't like something, you either change it or change your attitude about it. Right. What, what exactly have you done in this particular case? Well, so, so um, the first thing, um, uh, we started to, uh, to have some uh, dialogue with the Israeli citizens. The reason why we did that is just because um, the public perception um, to foreigners, strangers, um, asylum seekers, whatever you name, um, is really very negative and very hostile. And we understood that there is... Um, uh, there is a gap of information that the citizens don't understand what does it mean to flee persecution, genocide, or dictatorship from your country. Like, they don't understand why people are coming to Israel. Now, we did that, I mean, in, in, in a way that um, to break the gap between asylum seekers and indigenous or, uh, Israeli citizens. And what happened is that um, the government, uh, or let's say some officials, are inciting the public negative opinion against the anti African asylum, I mean, anti African asylum seekers. So it has been really difficult to communicate with the citizens and also with the government. We um, demonstrated, and I, I think um, one of the most impressive uh, things that we have achieved, we have done, that 50,000 people demonstrating in one place peacefully is sending a strong message explaining to the public that we are fleeing persecution, we are indeed refugees, and we deserve refugee status. Israel is one of the signatory states to the Geneva Convention, and it must fill its international obligation. And we made that very clear, and of course we didn't make a huge change, but still uh, there is a slight change in the Israeli government's policy. What about uh, the history of Israel itself? I mean, when you think about it, uh a lot of their relatives, uh, when ex especially you look around the Second World War, uh, they were beneficiaries, frankly, of uh, asylum in a lot of countries. Why would that be a very strange thing for the average Israeli to accept another well, asylum is... seeker from somewhere in Africa? It's, it's a very interesting point you mentioned, and, I, and this is what we're always talking about. In fact, we were saying this is not, especially when it comes to Israel, Israel must lead the world when it comes to immigration because they're coming from there. They were persecuted, and they're the ones 
initiated the Geneva Convention. In fact, I don't speak about the international obligations. It is, this is a moral thing, especially for Jewish people who have been persecuted and been um, killed um, thousands of years ago. I think um, the problem with uh, leadership in the country today, they forgot their moral obligation also, their international obligation. And I think one of the main problems also, there is a fear and paranoia because when you speak this right, people will say, okay, we have a small country when you cannot absorb entire Africans in our country. And there will be, I mean, we're under demographic threat. They forgot something called, I mean, asylum seeking is that we're not, I mean, we're not here forever. We're just for a temporary um, shelter, you know what I'm saying? And we have dream to go back, our, I mean, our homes. We want to build our continent. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that this Israeli public don't understand. And I mean, this is, a, uh, I mean, the, 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 the idea of working closely with Israeli citizens to make them understand that asylum seekers are not demographic trade and fear will not solve the situation, it would rather be uh, hope. Yeah. What are your prospects of asylum? I have uh, seen you appear on several Israeli television, uh, radio, uh, you know, discussions and stuff like that. Uh, what is the mood like now? Uh, is it possible that, in fact, at the end of the day, you may become uh, accepted as a refugee legally in Israel? Well, so, yeah, there is, I mean, speaking of refugees in Israel, there are two major groups, uh, Sudanese and El friends. And we're about 40, uh, 45,000 um, people from Sudan. Of course, there are some from Western African countries, from Nigeria, from Ghana, Guinea, Ivory Coast, and many. So, especially Sudanese and Israelis, were under something called group protection. They have conditional release visa, uh, stating that they cannot be deported back, their countries of origin, acknowledging that the, there is a serious problem in Sudan, and there is dictatorship and slavery in Eritrea, uh, and grave uh, human rights violation. Now, the status that we're given, I mean, doesn't allow us to work, doesn't allow us to have access to um, social and health service, uh, and um, so this is this. Um, I mean, this is the so Speaking of refugees being recognized in Israel, I can just tell you, and it's really sadly, only four people being recognized as refugees. Only four among Sudanese and Eritreans. So, how do you survive uh, on a daily basis? Uh, can you walk us through a day in your life in Tel Aviv, for example? So if you're in Tel Aviv, uh, all you have to do is, um, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of people working in, in, uh, in a, I mean, um, restaurants, hotels, because um, their, visa don't, uh, their visa don't allow them to have proper jobs. Now, uh, I mean, uh, personally, I, I run an organization. This is a community-based organization, which is an amazing and impressive thing. Uh, but others are really suffering. A lot of people don't have work. A lot of people find difficulties to run houses. For example, um, uh, I mean, you can go to a landlord and tell you, oh, as for Sudanese, we do not run houses for Sudanese and trans or, you know, anyone else, uh, especially uh, from African uh, descendants. So the life is really difficult. And on top of that, systematic racism and hatred and violence from um, um, citizens. I'm saying, I mean, there is, um, uh, I mean, a systematic incitement from some officials. I'm not saying the entire government was some officials, inciting the public against Afri African asylum seekers. And therefore, I mean, I, I can give you two examples of um, a kid of 20, a uh, year and a half was stabbed in the head just because she is an Eritrean. Um, and the same man was just, uh, his hand was cut two months ago um, just because he's an Eritrean. And this is just a simple. Um, see, I mean, this is a simple uh, life, I mean, that we are having in, in Tel Aviv streets. I mean, it's really hard. But in the end, there are many Israelis also supporting the, the, this our struggle, supporting African asylum seekers, and also they're saying that Israel must act different. And this is not the Israel, as the Jews said, that we built and we belong to. Talking about uh, racism and perhaps uh, uh, profiling, uh, how can they possibly target uh, an Eritrean when, the last time I checked, uh, they do have a substantial, uh, a substantial population that came from Ethiopia. We're talking about Falashas. Mm -hmm. How can they tell the difference between you and the Falashas, well, for that matter? I'll tell you something. Uh, there are Ethiopians 
forbidden, they've still been beaten in, in the streets of um, uh, Tel Aviv just because they look at the Trans or Sudanese. I tell you more than that, there is um, a diplomat from Africa who was beaten um, in Tel Aviv because he looks Sudanese and the Trans. And I tell you, it's, I mean, the problem is um, not because we are not refugees, so not because we are um, work migrants, but because we are very easy to identify. Speaking of foreigners in Israel, there are more than 90,000 foreigners, not from Africa, from Europe, from Asia, and nobody is speaking about them because you cannot identify them. And if you, uh, if you know what I mean, it's because the color of the skin is very easy to identify Africans. So uh, Ethiopians are, are, are also under, under uh, threat, under fear, because they look through the Eastern entrance. And that's the main uh, problem here. Well, good luck, uh, Mutasim. We have to stop right there. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ali of the African Refugee Development Center in Israel for taking some time to interact with us. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter. And we are tweeting live for us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka and join in on today's discussion. With your questions and comments, don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Migrant Crisis or hashtag Migrant Crisis. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. The European Union is putting in place measures to address the increasing number of people claiming asylum in the bloc, often after a perilous journey across the Mediterranean. Here are elements of the main plan. Number one, a naval mission. Following the drowning of some 800 people on a single boat off Libya in April, the EU effectively reversed a sharp cutback in warships conducting search and rescue operations. Since June, a naval operation has been targeting people smugglers. Plans to roam far into Libyan waters are on hold, seeking UN support. Number two, emergency assistance. The EU has paid for food, medicine, shelter, and other needs for refugees in countries which have asked for it. Italy and Greece will get nearly half of 2.4 billion euros to help with the crisis over several years. An initial 30 million euros is due in Greece, where a government consumed with the debt crisis surprised many by not triggering the EU disaster relief system, as Hungary did, to get tense urgently. Britain and France have had funds to deal with refugees at the Channel Tunnel. Number three, relocation. Other EU states aim to take 24,000 asylum seekers from Italy and 16,000 from Greece, modifying the EU's Dublin mechanism by which asylum claims are processed in their first country of arrival. Leaders rejected binding quotas proposed by the EU executive. Voluntary pledges have fallen short so far at 32,000 in total. The Commission also aims to have a permanent relocation system agreed upon this year. Number four, resettlement. Having rejected mandatory national quarters to take in 20,000 refugees direct from UN sites outside Europe, states pledged to take 22,000 in total in a pilot scheme. It will start soon and may expand in cooperation with UN agencies already assisting some 4 million Syrians as well as millions of other refugees. Number five, hot spots. Accompanying the relocation of asylum seekers from Italy and Greece, other EU states will staff hot spots in Catania and Piraeus to identify and fingerprint refugees. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. 
When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizui. You what? And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you uh, immediately, Demetrius. You listened to uh, Mutasim Ali from Tel Aviv. Uh, are you surprised? Um, yes and no. I'm surprised by the intensity of the reaction of the Israelis. Um, but at the same time, the color barrier and the religious barrier which is also, in a sense, an ethnic mm -hmm. barrier for, for the Jewish state, um, helps explain it, not justifying it. I think it is completely unjustifiable. And the only thing I can say is that unless we find a bigger solution than simply trying to go to Israel or another place, I think we're all going to be, in a sense, experiencing things that will make us ashamed of ourselves. Why is it that uh, people tend to have a short memory? Because uh, it's only about 70 years ago since the end, really, of uh, the Second World War, and you had plenty of Europeans, really, uh, going all over the world looking for sanctuary. Indeed. And it's not just the 70 years ago. It's been going on for a couple of hundred years in this country. And this country always welcomed people minorities, religious um, minorities, etc., etc. I think there is short memory. I think people are trying to protect what they have, which is a good life, let's face it. But more important than that, I think it is, and trying to be fair here, I think it is how quickly this crisis escalated. When you had 50 or 75,000, you know, it was manageable. When you have 200,000 or 500,000, and when the waves keep coming, then it becomes less manageable. Mm. The thing that I find remarkable is the reaction of certain European leaders, the positive reaction, the extraordinary re reaction by Frau Merkel of Germany, of Sweden, etc., etc. Incredible. Incredible is the exact word for that. And what about Hungary? What about Poland? And these are countries that possibly, uh, I would imagine this would be their argument, we're not rich countries. We have forgotten that in 1956, Europe and the United States took 200,000 Hungarians in a matter of just a few months. As you said in the beginning of this conversation, you know, memory is awfully <laughs> short. I think Poland and many of the other countries are basically saying, you're far richer than we are. You're the ones who are opening up your doors. Mm -hmm. We don't want to participate in this. But the tension here, I think what we all ought to be watching about, is what will happen next Monday on the 14th when the interior ministers of all of the EU member states meet mm. to try to see whether they can have initial agreement on what President Juncker said today. Demetrius, the talking about being surprised or not being surprised, uh, what about uh, the silence from the Middle East, for example? We're talking about Saudi Arabia, incredibly rich, very few people. What about Kuwait? What about uh, the United Arab Emirates? I'm glad that this has turned to be a real conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Back uh, in the 1970s, before the late 1970s, these very same countries were taking an awful lot of people from the rest of the Middle East to do the work that now is done by people from Southeast Asia. This was a conscious decision on their part because they did not want to constantly have to import the passions and the disagreements and everything else of the people in their immediate neighborhood. Now, 40 years later, they take amazing numbers of Southeast Asians and they're not taking that many, certainly not as refugees, people from the immediate region. They do, however, do some other things that we need to also acknowledge. They're putting an awful lot of money on the table, and that's very important. And Saudi Arabia, at least, has been giving work visas to a lot of Syrians. And when those visas come up for renewal, they're systematically renewing them. 
I think what we're beginning to see is the breaking down of or the, the sort of pushing back against countries that are not doing anything mm -hmm. and the beginnings of at least a real conversation about a global response to the crises. And I don't mean just Syria, the crisis in plural, you know, North Africa, you know, East Africa, et cetera, et cetera. It would either be the, new, the dawn of a new era or we're going to really go backwards and things are going to get much worse. Talk to us about uh, reaction or response from Turkey, for example, where you have almost two million human beings so far. Uh, talk about Lebanon and talk about Jordan, smaller Jordan. If you or I were in Jordan or Lebanon or southern Turkey, we'd be very upset and for a very good reason. Why? Because we're hosting, among the three of us, hosting almost four million Syrians and we have been doing this for three or four years. Lebanon and Jordan are not wealthy countries. Uh, they are also countries that are a bit, you know, unstable or at least, you know, always worried about stability. And yet they are hosting about a million each and mm -hmm. Turkey about 1.7 million. And Europe, until the last three weeks, was having an argument about what to do with 40,000 refugees. And the European Union member states were refusing to agree to the formula. So the burden is completely unequal. But I think people are beginning to wake up, in Europe in particular, but the United States and other places too. Very interesting. Uh, Itai, what about you from your vantage point? Uh, what can you tell us, first of all, because I gather that uh, you and the UNHCR are looking at this situation differently in the sense that uh, you are referring to refugees as migrants, and the UNHCR is saying, no, these are refugees. What is the fundamental difference between those two concepts? Well, I think the, the broad... I'm, I'm asking um, Itai. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Shaka. I mean, the main uh, issue that we should say is that, first of all, we're looking at uh, human beings who are in desperate situations, whether they're fleeing persecution, conflict, or they just want to, 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 to go to somewhere where they can get a better life. So I know the debate lately, uh, inspired by one of the news channels, has been on um, looking at what, what terminology we're going to use. What we say is um, the people that we're seeing now is what we could term mixed migration flows. So asylum seekers, refugees, uh, and migrants. Because we have to also be honest and say that there are people who are moving because they need to improve uh, their circumstances. But ultimately, whether they are refugees, asylum seekers, or migrants, they, if they need support, what we are saying, and I think we are quite equivocal together with our, our, our colleagues in the UNHCR, that they need support. I think when we're talking to, when we talk about definitions, specifically, quite a lot of people who come into Europe, let's say, uh, sometimes for them to stay, whether or not they uh, deserve or warrant getting international protection, the only avenue that they have, because there aren't that many uh, safe uh, migration channels, is to seek asylum, even if they don't want to or they don't need to. So right now, as we know, those people that come in in whatever numbers, ultimately, if they go through the asylum process, some of them, or the, the majority of them, based on the current um, determination processes in Europe, will not make it and ultimately may be sent back to the countries of origin. But the main point, I suppose, that we have to reiterate again and again is that these are desperate people, whether they're migrants again or refugees, they need support. And we hope, I mean, it's, it's a bit too late to be coming up with all these 10-point um, uh, plans or trust funds. Of course, we welcome them, but we are not talking about people dying crossing the Mediterranean for the first time. This has happened over the years. And every time something... Uh, spurs people into action, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the dreadful photo of the, of the young boy or the numbers, uh, the huge numbers that uh, perished in, in April, or going back a few years to the shipwreck of uh, Malta, we always talk about these things that we're going to come up with a solution, but ultimately we come, we come around to nothing happening. And that's really a, a big concern of us. But just going back to your point about definitions, Yes, they are important. I mean, uh, we, we, we live in, a, in, in, in an era where, uh, you know, sometimes labels uh, uh, stick and sometimes when they stick, 
uh, they can cause all sorts of problems. In this case, we say if people are refugees, then they should get international protection. But that should not be create sort of like, like a hierarchy of needs where, because if you're not a refugee, then you're an undeserving migrant. That's the risk that we face when we really sort of entrench ourselves with these de definitions. I see. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariam Jaro. Take it away, Mariam. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the very touching feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan in Tanzania who responded to our question of the week. Hosea Josia in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania writes, I don't think that addressing the crisis of African refugees fleeing to European countries with money will do any good in putting an end to the problem. I recommend the European Commission sets up incentives to make African countries repatriate their citizens whose asylum applications are rejected and labeled as illegitimate. The Commission should help in settling down conflicts and investigate other motives that make African refugees make these perilous journeys. In my opinion, giving them monetary assistance is not a solution. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidu Ewart, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Struggling to cope with the growing refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, European leaders promised to triple their spending on border protection. The plan is to address the immense overflow of refugees and prevent disasters like the recent capsizing of a ship carrying mostly African refugees off the coast of Libya, an incident that killed thousands. Well, this brings us to our question of the week, asking, what step should the EU take to safeguard Africans that are risking their lives to migrate to Europe? Well, thanks all for using uh, all our social media platform to communicate to us. Let's begin with a comment from Omunua Okugbo Igodalo from Abuja in Nigeria, who writes, The best way out of the refugee crisis is for both the EU and the African Union to be proactive. The European Union can partner with African governments to ensure that Africans are more productive and appreciated at home. If Africans perceive they have a promising future at home, and their, and their self-esteem is significantly in, enhanced, they will probably not risk their lives crossing the Mediterranean Sea in an illegal and shameful manner. Another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA Migrant Crisis or hashtag Migrant Crisis. And if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. Let's now go to two tweets from Bubakar Ndiaye, who writes, the main thing the EU can do to safeguard refugees is by providing a favorable environment and to document them. Bubakar continues on to tweet by saying, let the EU see how best they can revise their immigration policies. Well, Shaka and Gas, your take on this one. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mariama. Itai, are you with us? I am indeed, yes, and, and, and I, I actually have a, quite a few points certainly on the last uh, comments. Go for it, please. Go for it. I, I think the, the, the viewer who sent in comments about uh, what can be done is spot on. I mean, one of the things that certainly has been lacking in the whole um, debate about what's happening now is uh, leadership from Africa, so especially from the African Union, on what 
the countries themselves in Africa can do to, to, to ensure that people are not desperate enough to travel to, 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 to Europe in the way that they are doing. For example, I mean, one thing that we, as the International Organization for Migration, are at pains to, to, to stress is that the numbers of people that are trying to make it to Europe is actually a fraction of the actual numbers that actually migrate within the African continent itself. Take, for example, ECOWAS. I mean, that is one of the um, more, I would say, uh, advanced in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, open borders where people can travel freely. And millions do do that every year, every month, every week. The point really being that if more countries, more regions, regional hubs within Africa are able to follow the same path, you find that people won't find uh, the need or the desperation to travel further afield to try and make a living. The reality is that quite a lot of us want to succeed closer to home. If we're not, if we can't do it right at home. The thought of going further afield is always quite daunting, and it usually takes a certain level of desperation to be able to do that. So I would say certainly charity begins at home. African countries should be doing more, whether it's just tackling issues pertaining to rule of law, uh, governance issues, um, but ensuring that their own people, their own uh, citizens have access to resources, can better their lives within, either, if not in the country of origin, but within the region. That's essential. African countries, yes, I can understand. But uh, talking about uh, the African Union, and you, for example, there, perhaps stretching the case, really, because you're talking about an institution that does not have sovereign powers. Is it really not an organization that has the teeth that cannot bite? Well, in that case, then, if it's not fit for purpose, we then have to evaluate what kind of... Um, uh, supranational body we, we have in Africa. I mean, I, I'm an African. I grew up in Africa, and I'm quite passionate, even though I've lived out of Africa for many years, of what we could be. I mean, we have the capacity to, 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 to do what uh, Europe has done. We have the capacity to do what South American uh, nations have done. All it needs is strong will and people who are, really have the best interests of the continent at heart. If, we, if they don't, if they have their interests in Swiss bank accounts or wherever else, then obviously they're not going to be interested in, 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 in pushing forward the, the continent. And the masses of young people who are trying to, to earn a living, whether they're migrating within the continent or trying to get to Europe, and as I say, that's a small fraction, those are the people that they should be looking at. That's a human resource that can be tapped into. But unfortunately, we, have, we do have a crisis of leadership where that certainly maybe is not even the top agenda of, uh, of the leaders. I'm actually coming to, to, to Ghana next week with uh, other IOM colleagues to actually meet with uh, various uh, governments from across Africa to look at migration, how the issue of uh, free movement within Africa is paramount for economic development, but also to cutting down these kind of um, uh, situations where we see people be desperate enough to get on flimsy vessels to try and get to Europe. That's actually in the interest of Africa to deal with this definitively. I'm sure that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people will agree with you that what is needed in terms of uh, leadership on the African continent, frankly, is what can perhaps be characterized as a paradigm shift. Yes. Well, Mariama, do you have any more feedback to share with us, please? Absolutely, and a lot of talk about the leadership in Africa, definitely. Let's move on uh, to a posting from William Kukulo from Zelemai in Liberia. He writes, the European Union should call on African leaders to stop the unnecessary corruption, greed for power, and focus on its citizens. If Africans continue to suffer from war, economic hardship, and injustices, there will always be illegal migration. Another Facebook comment uh, comes from uh, Nim Rogers of Kampala in Uganda. He says... I think the Europeans should stop exploiting Africa in all forms, but instead help the continent develop so that Africans stop looking to Europe as the only option. Well, Shaka, quite an interesting uh, pair of uh, comments here. Shaka, and guess your take on these ones. Very interesting indeed, and I hope it is also equally interesting for you, Dimitrius, your reaction. They are. Uh, they're lofty goals. They're not easily achievable. But nonetheless, um, the European Union is trying to figure out how to work 
with the African Union in order to begin a, a process, a slow process that may lead us to the goals that we all share around this table. Um, in late November, in Valletta, Malta, there will be a, a summit of the European Union with the African Union leaders. And needless to say, the major topic of the summit will be precisely this set of issues. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that somehow we're going to have, you know, a new plan, but the fact that Mr. Juncker, the president of the commission today, asked, called for a trust fund for Africa, means that a lot of political capital will go to try to make that particular summit mm -hmm. a bit more of a success than summits usually are. Uh, as for the issue of whether the, Europe, uh, the African Union, meaning as an organization, should have more teeth, um, this, as, you, as we understand from Europe, that uh, has been in this business since 1951, uh, this is not an easy thing. Um, countries are not eager to give up their sovereignty to another sovereign. And just like in Europe in these recent days, Different countries in Africa will see those issues in a different way. So we have a long way to go, but this is a wake-up time. And I think there is an opportunity here for us to begin to do the harder things. What about uh, someone who will say that uh, we all belong to the same human race, human tribe, that in fact, there is more than enough on this planet Earth, frankly, that uh, is there for all of us. There is certainly a, an increasing number of people who think in these terms. There has always been a, a sort of one of the underlying themes in conversations, not just in the last 20, 30 years, but, you know, forever, as mm -hmm. it were. But for better or worse, back 400, 500 years ago, we created a state system. And that state system still is the way that we organize ourselves. Where is altruism when it is needed? I think that altruism will come in once people begin to realize that the current situation is unsustainable. One of the conversations that some people ought to be having, not the heads of government yet, but people, you know, in the academic community, in the policy community, is exactly whether the state system as it exists with regard to humanitarian crisis in particular is really serving all of the people who need to be served, those people who are in crisis, uh, natives, you know, in other words, the, the publics inside the countries, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the system serves all of these interests well. The Westphalian system? It is the Westphalian <laughs> system. I think that uh, if we continue to go the way that we're going, <laughs> pretty soon it will become almost irrelevant because if I want to say something fairly dramatic, I will say the following thing, which is the Mediterranean borders of the European Union are vanishing in front of our eyes. And I know that, you know, the European Commission, you know, Juncker spoke about it today, the interior ministers will talk about it, will try to recreate borders that maybe don't exist in the same way that we understood them, mm -hmm. let's say a mere year or a year and a half ago, and I do not know how, which way the conversation will turn, but certainly it's worth having a conversation about this issue. We'll get back to that later. Time happens not to be our best ally. Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that will do it for today's uh, social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. If you are a new fan, just drop us a line at, uh, at uh, africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa. Also, follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Go to our VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program.
Next week on Straight Talk Africa, Shaka goes one-on-one with Sam Kuteza, the outgoing president of the United Nations General Assembly. The 69th session ends on Tuesday. Mr. Kuteza will be with us live next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. Let's go to the last line of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, good evening, Buba from Nigeria. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Shaka. I am hugely terrific. How are you today? Yeah, uh, it's fine with us here in Kaduna, Nigeria. What is now, uh, your question, please? Uh, my, uh, my question, my question, sir. Now, don't you see the indiscriminate uh, uh, migration? is as a result of poverty, uh, a, a bad leadership, a, also with neocolonialism that is associated with all this that compel people to move away from Africa to, to look for greener pasture anywhere else. This is my question. Now, Thank another you. comment Another comment is... Uh, 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 one of the days when uh, the racism is existing to some certain extent that uh, the, the slave seekers do come for Africa for slavery. Nowadays, uh, Africans that are taking themselves for slavery to uh, neocolonialists. Now, what are you saying over that? Uh, 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 thank you very much, and uh, 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 I wish you stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Buba, all the way from Nigeria. Itai, could you please respond to that? Yes, I, and, and unfortunately, hopefully, I, I will make justice of um, the viewers' as, as, as question. I, could, I couldn't hear parts of it. But um, what I'll say is that, yes, of course, there are many mitigating uh, factors as to why uh, people are forced to, 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 to move the way they are. And obviously, if you see people getting onto vessels that are obviously unseaworthy, or people try and cross the desert with very few, uh, some some actually not making it, then you realize that there's a desperation that is there. Yes, um, uh, for me, I think the challenge is dealing with what we have now. Yes, historically, people have suffered from colonialism. Uh, some may even say there's neo-colonialism, but ultimately, the buck should stop with a. Uh, the current leaders that we have, say, taking it from the African perspective, the buck should also stop with um, uh, the European Union, which is, uh, whether they like it or not, I suppose, at the receiving end of people trying to make uh, their way there because they feel that that's where they're going to, to be safe or that's where they're going to earn a better living. But the danger is that we get uh, uh, sort of bogged down in, in semantics about um, uh, history this or history that. But ultimately, if we see a situation where people are dying uh, in, in large numbers crossing the, the sea or crossing the desert, and, and we actually feel that actually as an organization, probably we don't know how many people lose their lives trying to cross the Sahara Desert from West Africa, say, all the way to, 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 to Libya and then, then on to the Mediterranean. The point is what can we do, what solutions do we have now uh, in countries that have been independent for 40, 50 years? Yes, they were colonized back then, but what are we talking about now in terms of leadership? As one of the um, uh, responders this evening has said, perhaps Africa needs strong leadership, not strong men. And that's really quite key in terms of progressing uh, and moving beyond the, the, the tragedies that we are seeing now. I see. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. If you wish to participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-6193-111. The U.S. country code is 1. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. The European Union is putting in place measures to address the increasing number of people claiming asylum in the bloc, often after a dangerous journey across the Mediterranean. Here are some key elements of the main plans. Number one, deportation. Economic migrants whose claims for refugee status fail will be returned home more quickly. The EU is working with countries to ensure that they take more people back. It's drawing up a shared list of safe states, notably Balkan EU membership candidates, for whose citizens' deportation will be almost automatic. 
Number two, aid. The EU will use its development aid budget to reduce poverty and other factors that drive migration to encourage governments to curb people smuggling gangs and discourage their citizens from migrating. There will be a summit with the African Union in Malta on November 11th and 12th and with Western Balkan countries in the next few weeks. Number three, foreign missions. Officials have steered away from suggestions that the EU should set up facilities to process asylum applications in Africa or the Middle East. Among other things, some say they could be vulnerable to attack and hard to manage. The EU is working with international agencies in Niger to inform those planning to head for Libya of the risks they face and low chances of being allowed to settle in Europe. Number four, legal migration. The EU executive is reviewing schemes to issue EU visas to skilled workers as among the safe routes for immigration. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther, give you your words. And let's go back to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, Patrick from Nigeria. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Shaka. I am Patrick huge. Okrafoff. I am hugely Patrick terrific. Okrafoff. Yeah, Patrick Okrafoff of uh, Arutuku here in Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Shaka, my question tonight is to our guests, why do the West, allow all these leaders that are governing the African continent with dictatorship policy to stay in power. See the number of migrants rushing to Europe for a greener pasture. Even this morning we saw on the screen, on uh, CNN, even on BBC, where women put to bed, uh, they, they just at the seaside. Well, I'm just praying, let God help the European countries that are welcoming all our Africans. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, what about that, Demetrius? Well, if I understood the caller, because the, uh, you know, the call is not very clear, um, there are a lot of dictatorships, you know, in Africa. People Correct. are fleeing for all sorts of reasons. Correct. The oppression that uh, dictators, you know, put their, their citizens through. Countries are mismanaged. Countries are mismanaged. The economies are mis mismanaged. As an earlier caller said, there's an awful lot of corruption. The rulers are not leading their They people. are not leading. They're not leading responsibly. And at some point, people decide to vote with their feet. And this is as old as, you know, migration, or for that matter, humanity itself. When well, the circumstances... Why, why don't they vote with their feet in the direction of state house? Why go to cross the Mediterranean? Well, because there is Europe that is, in a sense, beckoning. In other words, the opportunities there appear to be so much better than anything around the place where people are leaving. And unless you create, in a sense, examples of vibrant economies with strong political systems mm. in Africa itself, mm. three, five, seven, eight, you're not really going to do away with the fact that everybody wants to go to Europe. And guess what? Uh, some of these dictators, in fact, protect their power with weapons manufactured from, guess where? Europe. I let's go not, to, I'm let's not going to argue. <laughs> let's go to Joseph uh, in Kenya. Good evening, Joseph. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Yes. 
This is this is Joseph Oko from Kenya, Butia. Yes, please. Yeah, and I'm now back, fully back in VOA. So what I want to talk about, what's happening in Africa, the biggest one is poverty. And second one is lack of a job. You know, nowadays, most of Africans, they have education, but they don't have a job. So maybe European countries, they will invest in Africa. I think they will help better. And uh, another one is uh, corruption. You know, in Africa, most of the governments, they are very corrupt, so they take the citizens down. So maybe when they will try to help us I see. in corruption, I think everything going to be all right, and Africans will be. And let me give Africans one point. No matter what, whoever you want to be, you can be wherever you are. There is no need you move here, up and down, but we don't know your future. Thank you very much. This is Joseph Popo from Busia, Kenya. You're most welcome. You're most welcome, Joseph, all the way from Busia, Kenya. Now, Itai, you obviously heard Joseph, uh, but you have also heard, for example, that uh, the birth rate, especially in Northern Europe, we're talking about countries like Germany, uh, countries like uh, the Scandinavian countries and what have you, is simply too low. Um, and that, in fact, uh, they may probably uh, be happy to receive uh, refugees, frankly, because these refugees, in fact, may end up adding value. What about that? Absolutely. And I, as, as Dimitri, uh, Dimitri said at the beginning, uh, we really should be commending the leadership that has been shown by Chancellor Angela Merkel in uh, sort of raising your head above the par parapet to say exactly that, that uh, Europe does actually need uh, migrants to fuel continued economic growth. I think Germany, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and I'm sure Demetrius can correct me if I'm wrong, if the German government has actually come out and said they need something in the region of half a million uh, migrants uh, over the next few years, on top of what they normally get to, able to, to be able to sustain the economic uh, growth that they currently uh, have. So it's up really to the politicians to be brave enough to make that argument. Right now, what we see across Europe is that very few politicians uh, are brave enough to make that argument without um, uh, fearing that they will lose their, their mandate or they'll be voted out of power. So it takes a, a certain, uh, I mean, we talk of a crisis of leadership in Africa, but also we need some sort of um, bravery amongst the European leadership to be able to make those arguments. I mean, you, you've mentioned those countries besides Germany or in the Scandinavian countries, uh, the birth, birth rates are certainly falling. And there will come a time when they really, really will start worrying about their pensions uh, in terms of who's going to work in the economies to sustain uh, the current, uh, uh, you know, people who are working now, who, where they're going to get their pensions without the workforce that they need. So those are the arguments that certainly need to be to be made, and we are certainly making them more and more. But we realize that for that argument to hold sway, Thank you. the politicians have to be brave enough. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. And on that note, thanks to our guests, Demetrius Papa Dimitriou, Senior Fellow and President Emeritus of the Migration Policy Institute and President of Migration Policy Institute Europe, and Itai Vilili, the Media and Communication Officer and Spokesperson at the International Organization for Migration. Mr. Vilili joined us via Skype from Geneva in Switzerland. And thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning is Daybreak Africa with James Butte. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.